Today on the Strong Women Podcast, we are excited to introduce you to Shannon Bream. Shannon is the host of Fox News at Night on the Fox News channel and is also the chief legal correspondent at Fox News. Um, She also hosts a Live in the Bream podcast for Fox Radio, too. Um, She is the author of two books, uh, One, Finding the Bright Side, The Art of Chasing What Matters, and also a new book, which we're going to talk about with her, um, titled The Women of the Bible Speak, The Wisdom of 16 Women and Their Lessons for Today. So Shannon graduated from Liberty University and also... um, Got a law degree at Florida State University, which is why she's a legal correspondent at Fox, because she's a journalist and a lawyer. And um, a fun fact about Shannon that we have this in common, Shannon, but you interned for a congressman in Florida. You were in Florida. I was in uh, California, and when I was in college, I interned for a congressman, Ed Royce. He was, uh, he's from out here, so... Um, I interned too, so I read that about you, and I'm like, oh, we did, we both did that, so that's kind of fun. But okay, so you didn't know this, Shannon, but we, um, we, you were nominated to us to have on this podcast by Molly Hemingway. And listeners, if you have not in uh, listened to our interview with Molly Hemingway, you have to. It was a wonderful interview. And anyways, but what Molly said about you is. She is the most wonderful colleague, hands down, at Fox News. She is just wonderful. So thank you, Shannon, for making time to be on the podcast and uh, for just coming on and sharing your story with us. Well, thank you so much. And honestly, Molly is one of the smartest, funniest, kindest people. And so I'm honored to be in the same company as her. Thanks for having me, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Shannon, we like to start at the very beginning because our childhoods shape us so much, you know. So we want to know, did you grow up in a Christian home and, um, you know, what kind of childhood did you have? I did, but it was like millions of kids uh, across the country (laughs) in that my parents uh, actually divorced when I was really young. I mean, I was a year old. I was born on on their second wedding anniversary, and by the third, uh, they were falling apart. They were really young when they got married. Um, my mom, a baby Christian, my dad, really not at all. So, um, Mm. it was my mom and I for a long time, the two of us with a single mom who was growing exponentially in her faith. Um, my dad eventually became a committed Christian as well. And, um, so it was very unusual and that I grew up in this, you know, going back and forth, this divorced home, but both sides ending up becoming really strong Christians. Um, really my mom so much, uh, modeling the faith to me all the time. I mean, Um, she ended up getting a job. She was a teacher at a Christian school, which was also associated, affiliated with a church. So we were in church community all the time. Um, We were there every time the doors were open. Then I went to Christian school all day and was with my mom. And so I was constantly being surrounded by scripture and by teaching and by more mature Christians. Um, So I feel like it was always a part of my awareness. Um, It was in middle school that I realized this had to be a personal decision for me, a personal commitment to Christ. Uh, accepting what he did on the cross, paying the price for my sins and accepting him in salvation. So I would say since then I'm a work in progress. Um, Like every practicing Christian, uh, I need forgiveness and mercy every day. And I'm glad that there is an endless well of it for us available in him. Um, So uh, not a traditional Christian home in the sense that you would think, but certainly one that gave me a lot of good roots as um, we all kind of grew in our faith together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I read about, I, I read your book, The the Finding the Bright Side. It was so fun. You're so funny. Like the, oh, the first, you. especially like those first few chapters, what, when you talked about um, your youth group showing Hell's Bells or something like that, like I, oh, yeah. I thought about, um, sorry, that is like the, the movie that a lot of churches were showing to say like <laughs> all the dangers of secular music, you know? Right. And I was cracking up because my husband was raised in a church like that. And he was shown hell's bells to be like, look at this terrible music. (laughs) And, and he was like, ACDC is awesome. (laughs) Yeah. When you hear the music later, you're sort of like, Oh, this is what they were hiding from me. Um, Yes, exactly. (laughs) There was a lot of caution, certainly when I was growing up. Yes. Yes. That's right. (laughs) But anyway, so you grew up in where, where did you grow up? What state? I was uh, born and raised in Florida. And uh, my family is mostly there, kind of lived all over the state, um, but grew up primarily in South Florida 
in Hollywood, Florida, just outside of um, Fort Lauderdale area. So fun in the sun. We literally, when I was a little girl, we lived in an apartment complex that my grandparents owned and ran on the beach. So um, mm-hmm. it literally was out in our backyard. That was our beach. And so you don't realize how great you have it um, when you're five and six, <laughs> you know, and you just run outside. When they say go outside and play, you're literally just walking out on the beach. Um, mm-hmm. But my grandparents, it was a it was a really cool situation because they had uh, a big primary apartment downstairs. And we, my mom and I had a little one bedroom upstairs. So it was like we lived with my grandparents, um, even though we were sort of in this, um, you know, apartment situation with other families and people. But there was a connection where I could get to my grandparents parents apartment and I feel so blessed that I had all of those years really being careful and close to them I mean um having dinner breakfast lunch and dinner and I mean I loved it anytime I could stay home sick from school was like party time because they would watch like Price is Right and we would eat you know Neapolitan <laughs> ice cream all day and so um I was really really close to my grandparents on that side of my mom's side because of that mm. situation oh that's Bob Barker yeah <laughs> that's the only version my grandma would ever know yes Bob Barker Get your so, pets made neutered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. Okay, so, Shannon, one thing, this is a Strong Women podcast. So we talk about, you know, th- these ideas that shape us, especially when we're young. But one one question I have for you is, especially knowing you grew up with a single mom, you're close to your grandma, what do you think your ideas were of – like femininity and womanhood as you like in those young years as you were being shaped like as you look back now do you think because you you know you grew, you grew up and went to college and became a lawyer and became a journalist and um so do you think those ideas um were shaped when you were young or what what was kind of the modeling you think that you picked up on Well, I definitely saw with my grandmother, somebody who was really independent and hardworking, but, you know, always made dinner every night. She kind of um, managed my grandfather who could be unruly at times. And, um, (laughs) you know, she was just kind of like the steady presence. And by the way, she has some gifts she took with her to heaven, which is she could get any stain out of anything. It was like she was a stain (laughs) whisperer. I don't know what her magical power was, but nothing was ever a problem if it was a stain because grandma could get it out. Um, Do you know her trick? I don't. I, I, like oh, I said, shoot. it went to heaven with her because like, if it was chocolate sauce, if it was turkey gravy, it didn't matter what it was. If it was carpet, if it was silk, it didn't matter. She would get it out of everything and we would just take it to her and it would magically come back perfect like it never happened. So I don't know, but that was definitely one of her superpowers. Um, mm-hmm. My mom, I think I just saw such a hardworking, faithful person because like I said, for many years, it was the two of us and um, she worked a lot and I didn't see her having a lot of fun. You know what I mean? She's like raising mm-hmm. a kid basically by herself and working and volunteering Hmm. at the church all the time. Um, But the thing is, I mean, I was one of those kids who definitely, um, if you're going to talk about femininity, um, I I got a lot of different messages. I felt very strong and smart because my mom was an educator and taught me, like, get your education. If you learn how to read, you can learn about anything. You can just go check out books from the library. Nothing can hold you back. You can figure things out and do whatever you want to do in life. So I very much got that message from her. Um, But there were times I felt like um, in the uh, church we went to when I was little growing up, there there was a little bit of legalism and a little bit like sort of women are supposed to be seen and not heard kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I very much bucked against that. I was never a rebellious kid in that I was smoking or drinking or doing any of that stuff. But I was always asking questions like, why can't women do this? Why can't women do that? Why can't I stand up in church and do this? Why can't I volunteer for that? Why can't I say this? Um, which I'm sure was my mom's nightmare because she was like trying to, you know, be a teacher at the school and be involved in the church and not have like the one kid who was constantly bucking all of the limitations. So I think if anything, it made me more determined that I was going to have a career and, um, you know, do whatever I thought I could do or wanted to do because there was no one was going to stop me. So it made me a little bit feisty, I think, in that Mm -hmm. way. Mm-hmm. Which is has played into like in it's like one of your strengths, right? You've got to be a little feisty with what you're doing now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. You just want to, um, you know, my parents were always about you can do anything you want to do, get your education. 
But my mom was also very big on humility and realizing that God has mm-hmm. a path, maybe different than ours and maybe our plan, but that he would probably lead us and nurture us in our passions and want us to use whatever gifts we might have um, for him. He's prepared us for good works to be done that he had laid out ahead of our time. So mm-hmm. um, my mom was really big on, on making sure that you would treat people with respect. And um, one of her favorite verses in Philippians, do nothing through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourself. So. So mm. she was all about getting in there, working hard, doing your part, but also being humble about it and um, looking out for ways that you can be lifting other people up and helping them as part of your journey. Hmm. Okay, so you decided to go to Liberty uh, University. And and is am I right that you got a scholarship? Because you did beauty pageants and you were Miss Florida, right? Or no, Miss Virginia. Right. And well, Florida, here, right? See, you guys know all my deep, dark secrets. Yes. Um, <laughs> when I was going to Liberty, um, I saw a poster on campus about this local pageant that was part of the Miss America program. And I had watched that growing up. I love watching that stuff with my mom and my grandma. And we would have like our little scorecards. And I thought these girls were like so super glamorous. And I don't know why, like, you know, buck tooth, weird glasses wearing little me just thought that would be a great idea one day. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it was this whole dreaming big thing that my mom kind of, you know, put in my brain. But I remember seeing that poster on campus and I was really scared the first year I didn't even go to the little meeting for because I was like, yeah, I could never do that. But the second year I kind of got my guts together and was like, I'm going to go check this out because there was a lot of great scholarship money uh, involved there. So um, I had a guy who cut my hair uh, when I was in school and he was like, oh, you should definitely do it. I can help you. So the first pageant I did was Miss Lynchburg, which is where Liberty is in Lynchburg, um, Virginia. And I was doing great. I thought I got up there on stage, had some mishaps. I, in the middle of my talent performance, which was a piano, which, by the way, this computer that I'm talking to you is set on the piano. That's what it gets used for now. Um, <laughs> and I totally blacked out and could not remember the next note in my song. And I remember looking oh out in the gosh. audience and it was like crickets were chirping and it was <laughs> so bad. I somehow stumbled through the piece and got done and like ran off stage and was like so embarrassed. But um, I was not crowned Miss Lynchburg, surprisingly. Um, and so my mom was sort of like, honey, maybe this is not your thing. And I very much felt like in that night it was not my thing. But listen, the guy who cut my hair also ran a local pageant that was a different local pageant. It was Miss Amherst County. And he said, come on, you did so great in the interview and all the other things. You can do this. Just work on your piano a little bit. And my parents were like, I don't think so. But I was sort of like, if I don't try this again right away, like I'll never do it again. And that was like a month later. So my parents didn't even come up from Florida for the pageant. I had to call them from the restaurant afterwards because it's before cell phones, a little victory party to say like, hey, I won. Uh, went on to They're Miss like, Virginia. what? I know. They were like, you didn't fall off the stage. Um, and I went on to Miss Virginia uh, a few weeks later. Again, this 19-year-old kid who had no experience really doing anything this sophisticated. And um, I remember I'm standing there as all the girls, they're holding hands and they're announcing all the winners and stuff. And they get down to the final thing. And I'm like, what? Why? What am I doing standing here? And they call my name as the winner. And then a few weeks later, you're off at Miss America. And it was just like one of the craziest things I've ever done, but I finished in the top 10 at Miss America and through all the scholarship money I won through that, um, I took a year off school cause you travel and do, you know, charitable stuff and talk to kids and visit with young women and do things all year. And, um, it paid my way through school. So yeah, I thought yeah. I was retired after that, but five years later I was in law school back in my home state in Florida and I got approached about doing the Miss Florida pageant, which feeds into the Miss USA pageant. I know it's weird, but Miss America, Miss USA are two different things. So, um, I did that and um, got to the finals of Miss USA, too. So not, it's not for everybody, but I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, you mm-hmm. know what? Um, you know what's so fun about having guests on is that we get to, like, dig into who you are before we get to meet you. So I feel like this is a little awkward that I know all this stuff about you. Know you know the stories. But yeah. I watched. I was like, what? She was like, you You got to the top six in Miss USA. So yes. I went to Miss USA no, 1995. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And I watched the whole thing. No, and didn't I look so hungry? I was starving. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but you were like, you were super articulate and you told the guy all about how 
um, you know, you brought in your law stuff and the, the mm -hmm. host guy was like, well, I didn't even know the president got involved in this and all that. But um, <laughs> I was like, I was cracking up because I, yeah, that was, that was 90s. That was the 90s. It was like the big hair. I had and fluffy hair and I don't think hair. I'd had a carb in like two years. I was so oh, angry when that was gosh. over. gosh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you can't live like that forever. No, you can't. No, but you for can't. season, maybe. Yes. Well, yes. I'm glad you. There's something about being on national TV in a swimsuit that will make you not eat. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> oh, motivation. So. You don't forget yeah. that's oh, coming gosh. up. <laughs> okay, but, but let's, let's move on in your story. You met Sheldon, your husband. Mm -hmm. He was a baseball player at uh, Liberty. Tell mm -hmm. us how that all happened. And, and I re I'd really love to get into, you know, tell us about what happened when you were engaged and he was diagnosed and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, I will give you the short version and I'll give you my version since he's not here to take issue with it. Um, we both went to Liberty. We were there the same years and we had friends in common, but we didn't know each other. Um, I was dating someone else. He was dating someone else. And so finally our senior year, um, this girl came to me and she was like, you guys have got to meet each other. So finally we're at this big homecoming game. Um, so our, our, you know, it, it turned out it was his birthday in October of our senior year. And she comes and grabs me at the game. She's like, you're here. He's here. I'm going to introduce you guys. So I'm there with my stepdad uh, hanging out, Jasper, who is very cool. And um, Sheldon comes over and is introduced to us. We meet. We chat a little bit. And we go on our way. Now, I was dating somebody who wasn't at Liberty. I was dating a guy long distance. You know, and I just didn't think it was like I need to introduce myself to this guy and say, by the way, I'm dating someone like in case you're super interested in me. <laughs> so I didn't say anything about it. So he called me a couple times and we would just chat about class or about school or whatever. And, you know, I had this long distance boyfriend. Now my husband says now like that was so terrible. I cannot believe you even talked to me on the phone while you had this long distance boyfriend. I'm like, you never asked me if I was dating someone. We talked about class stuff and whatever. So what I didn't know is that night that we met, he went home over to his girlfriend's house and broke up with her. Cause he was like, I've met this woman and I know that I want to date her and I don't want to ever do that behind your back. Oops, so a couple so weeks it, later, you on the other hand, <laughs> but I didn't know that that's where this was going. So right. a couple weeks later, we're at the main class area, DeMoss hall at Liberty. And he's decided he's going to come ask me out that day, like on a real date. I wish they still did that. Cause it really is so sweet. Um, I don't think kids do that very much now. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. um, kids but these what days. he did not know, I know I'm the crazy old lady now that <laughs> these days, uh, what he didn't know was that my boyfriend was there visiting. So he's <gasps> over back in the day, pretending to be on the pay phone, boop, 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 like talking to people on the fake, you know, phone attached to the wall. And he's waiting for me to come out from this crowd so he could pull me aside and ask me out. So we, I come walking by with this guy holding hands and he's like, what the, he did not know. So he, uh, he called off abort mission. There was no asking out on date, but he also went and got back with his girlfriend. So I'm responsible for that too, I think. So a semester goes by. I had broken up with this guy. And I said to my friend who lived down the street from Sheldon, I said, don't tell him I'm asking about him, but is he still dating that girl? She's very nice. They've been together for a while, whatever. And she immediately runs down. Guess who's asking about you and tells him everything. He breaks up with that girl again. <laughs> And Sorry, then, girl, whoever you are. I know. And she's so sweet, happily married, kids, great family, the whole thing. But um, he then, he and I start talking again. And so I'm now fully free. We're both single. The whole thing's going on. And he says something to me about us being great friends or something like that. And I get the feeling like he's kind of blowing me off. Like he's not asking me on a real date. I don't know what's happening. He tells me later, like he doesn't want to be a week after he breaks up with this girl dating her two and a half years, walking around campus with somebody else dating, whatever. So he's trying to pump the brakes. So I saw him in that hall again, like the day or two later and just kind of said hi and kept walking. I did not stop to have our chat or anything like that. And he was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. And I was like, no, you kind of said, put the brakes on like this is gonna be a friend thing. He's like, no, I didn't. I'm just trying not to be a jerk and be instantly dating someone else. So he finally asked me out and it pretty much was the rest was history from then on. I, we were together all the time. And I think I knew very quickly, like this guy is a very quality guy, very close to his family, strong in his own walk with Christ. And, um, there's no cleanup on aisle 15. I'm going to have to do here. <laughs> We did end up, um, a couple years later, I was in law school and my dad had threatened to kill us if we got married before I graduated. So um, we're trying to wait that out and do everything the right way. And we did get engaged um, my second year, I guess. And so 
we had decided we would get married in the middle of my third year. And my dad was like, all right, you'll be one semester away from this. I don't think you're going to drop out. I will give you my blessing. So we got mm. engaged. And that's about the time, too, um, that I competed in Miss Florida and then on to the Miss USA pageant. And Shell had been having some weird physical issues during that. Um, we thought like an ear infection or something. He was having ringing in his ear and antibiotics and stuff. Nothing seemed to be really working. Well, not long after I got home um, from Miss USA, and I was totally at peace, honestly. I can remember being on stage as they're counting us down and, you know, thinking like, Lord, your will be done. Um, and I was just at peace when I didn't make the final three people and wasn't Miss USA. Um, and when I came home, I mean, everything made sense because it was shortly after that that he finally... Um, the ear, nose, and throat doctor he'd been seeing said, there's one thing we have to rule out. It's long shot, you're young, you're healthy, but you may have a brain tumor, which was like, what? I mean, never in a million years would we think that he felt great. There wasn't anything going on like that. It was just this ringing and stuff bothering him in his ear. And it turned out that's what it was, is that he had a brain tumor. And so mm -hmm. that year was, I'm sure, the worst year of his life in so many different ways. It was a real struggle. Um, not long after he was diagnosed, his dad died rather suddenly. So that year was just oh. incredibly painful and trying and dark. Um, and he had complications from his a, a fabulous, amazing brain surgeon, the Lord led us to, um, who was somebody who had pioneered the surgery for the exact tumor that Sheldon had. So he was in the best mm -hmm. possible care and the best possible hands. But um, he had some um, side effects that we were warned could come. But you don't think about it when you're just thinking, I just want to survive this thing. And he had paralysis um, of his face, um, much like you would see somebody who's had a stroke um, or Bell's palsy, something like that. Very discouraging for a 24-year-old guy who I mm. say is handsome then, is handsome now. Um, but just a real shock to your system to find out that you have a golf ball-sized brain tumor that's got to be addressed um, right away. Mm. So our plan was to get married at the end of the year in December, and he just kind of for months was sort of checked out. I mean, just depressed and I think really hit hard by everything his body was going through. Uh, I think people who have had major physical challenges will tell you there's a major emotional challenge that goes with that too. Um, and it's hard to see when you're in the middle of it. And when we're both 24 years old, we don't know what you do when you think you might be clinically depressed. We don't even know what clinically depressed is. I mean, you just don't know these things. Um, I'm glad that there's much more of a conversation about that stuff now. Um, yeah. And I would say to him like, do you still even want to get married? What do you, and he'd say, I don't know, whatever you want to do. I mean, he just was kind of the loss of his father and then this physical trauma mm -hmm. that he went through was really difficult. But, um, you know, I talked about my first book, This Moment, where it was um, a couple months out from our wedding, and they had told us if he's going to have any return of function to these nerves in his face, you know, it's about six months, and then we kind of say it's not coming back. We're sitting at Pizza Hut at the all-you-can-eat buffet. I think it was like $2.99 or $3.99. It was definitely – our budgetary situation <laughs> and we're sitting there for lunch I'm on a break from classes he's on a break from work and I saw the corner of his mouth move and I didn't want to say anything because I wanted to be sure they said that's where it would start so he kept talking and I saw it again and I said oh my gosh I grabbed the compact out of my purse and shoved it in his face and like I think I saw your mouth moving I think I saw the corner of your mouth he looks and he can see that there is this little movement and we are jumping around in Pizza Hut like crazy people um, like, your face is moving, your face is moving, you're going to get better, this is all so good. Um, and it was just such the first moment of joy after a year and months and months and months of darkness. And mm -hmm. we got married a few weeks later, and um, he's fully recovered, oh. praise God. He is um, solid, tricked me into running a marathon since then. I mean, he's a true <laughs> athlete, and um, he's doing great. That's Aww. awesome. So, Shannon, what was... So what was your faith journey during that time? Because, you know, um, we we make these plans and you're engaged and you're young, you and your husband and you're doing beauty pageants, you're in law school, you're really, you know, you're really doing things. And then, um, you know, things thwart our plan that we we think is perfect and we think God should bless. <laughs> and And then things like this happen and they can really shake our faith. They can strengthen our faith. They can teach us things about God that we didn't know before. So when when you think back to that time, what was that year like for you? I think you learn a lot about trying to be a good emotional support and trying to be um, understanding. I, I think we all come out of the womb to some extent selfish and self-focused, and that's kind of how we operate as humans. Um, but a year like that will um, really test you. I mean, I was a little still nervous about marriage because my parents were divorced and I'd been back and forth with that. I ended up having an amazing stepmom and stepdad. 
And so I saw that marriage could be a good positive thing, but I still was really frightened to do it for myself. And that year showed me that Sheldon was, um, you know, an amazing human being, the love of my life and somebody that I would sacrifice anything to make his life better and to be with him. Um, we both, I think, grew in our faith. It was a roller coaster. I talk about how we would get notes from people from churches that would say, and of course this is before email and everything else, um, we heard about your story and we put you on the prayer list. And what a beautiful thing to see that the body of Christ, that people, and I, I know this now because I pray for people that I hear something through the grapevine and I'll never probably meet them this side of, the, of heaven. And I have people tell me all the time, I've been praying for you, you don't know, I knew about this situation. So it's just a beautiful thing to me to see the body of Christ just step up as we're supposed to and be supportive of people bearing each other's burdens, even if we don't personally know them. That was one of the really big takeaways for me for that year with Sheldon. Okay, Shannon, I feel like we have so many questions for you, but we're going to try to make it, we're going to try to zone in a little bit. But I want to know, because here you are in law school, law school, and now you're at Fox News. Okay, so mm -hmm. <laughs> something happened in the middle of all that, and I know you had an interest in journalism. So tell us how that transition went from law school to journalism. Yeah, my dad said, go to law school or med school. You're picking one. That was it. <laughs> oh, um, wow. There I'm you not go. medical Limited. material. Um, but I think my dad really <laughs> wanted to make sure that I would be able to take care of myself. I think he knew I was a good student academically. I was strong. And so he just was kind of pushing me to do the best I could. Um, very interested in politics and law. So that made sense for me. But when I was in law school, I thought, I'm not going to be a traditional lawyer. I don't think the rest of my life. I don't think I'm going to sit there at a firm and do the traditional route for the rest of my life. Um, I just didn't think it would work for me. So I did practice for a few years at a great firm in Florida, and I'm so grateful for that experience and um, the investment they made in me and showing me the ropes and, and teaching me as a young lawyer. But during that time, I really had this journalism bug. I've always had this like current events kind of digging in kind of thing. I, like I, I want to know what's going on all the time. So I did decide that finally after, you know, my husband and I pray about these things and we get counsel from people. I said, I'm going to do an internship at a local station just to see what it's about. And that had so many hurdles in it from people who said, you can't do it unless you're an active college student. You know, I would just try to wear people down, which is my philosophy in life for getting things done. And I finally found um, a dean at the mass communication school at the University of South Florida where I was practicing law in Tampa. And he finally agreed to let me take some credit hours for an internship at the local station because I couldn't get in there without college credit hours, but I was like pushing 30 at this point. And he said, you got to do a news writing class, which is good because it's a totally different style. I had to learn. And if you do that, I'll also let you do these hours over at the station. So the station said, okay, you can come in and work nights and weekends. And I would just work whenever I could get away from the firm. And I loved it immediately. And I would go with reporters or producers who would let me shadow them. And there were some who were so kind to me who taught me when they didn't have to do it, there was nothing they were getting out of it, but they were just kind. And one photographer, I tried to buy him dinner one night and he said, nope, I just want you to promise me that when someone else comes to you for help or wants to shadow you, that you will do the same thing. So I've tried to do that. COVID's made it hard this last year, but I try to let, you know, folks come in and um, spend time with our college associates, um, interns, but that's, you know, we call them college associates. So just try to spend time with them and pour into them because they were kind people who did that for me. Um, and I would go out and, and shoot little stand-ups or chase a story or do whatever I could. Um, and I went to my boss one day at the station and said, hey, I'm going to quit my law firm job and come work for you. And he's like, no one's offered you a job. And I'm like, I know, <laughs> but I'm stepping out on faith. And I went to my firm and told them I'm going to leave. I'm going to pursue a job in television. And most of them were like, good for you. Great. Um, good luck. I can't believe you're leaving. Um, but there were a couple who said to me, there was something else I always wanted to do and I never did it. So I'm going to be cheering for you. Hmm. So, oh. um, there was a job that opened up. It was a big pay cut and it was 2 AM to 11 AM. And I went in and answered the phones and I made coffee and I started by writing scripts for the morning show anchors. Eventually somebody left. I started working the teleprompter. Um, then a producer a few months in left, so I started doing little production of the little cut-ins that you see to Good Morning America, like the local anchors come on and do weather and traffic and stuff, and so I would produce those. And once in a while, I would get to go out and do something, and so I would take it back to my boss and say, could you look at my writing? Can you check this out? And then one day I came in, and there was a note in my box that said, hey, we're going to start sending you on stories now, like if everyone else is in car wrecks in the hospital and no one can go to these stories and you're the only living, breathing 
human that we have, we will send you on these stories. And I'm like, you're the I'll last take it. person you're that's the available. Last human alive. We will. Like, and so I started doing that here and there. I would do little stories, and I watch my tapes. And um, my boss was really cheering me on. He was great. He gave me a chance. Well, then there was a huge management shakeup. He left, and his boss, the big boss, left. And so. Everybody told me the station is the worst thing that could happen when they get new people in. Everybody gets fired. And I'm like, well, not me because I'm getting paid nothing and doing like <laughs> jobs. And I have the best attitude because I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> well, about two weeks into the new boss, I got called into the office and the head of HR was sitting there. And I'm like, I'm getting promoted. But no, if the head of HR is sitting there when your boss wants to talk to you, you're probably not getting promoted. And this guy told me, um, you're the worst person I've ever seen on television. And I don't know why anybody thought it was a good idea, but you're never, ever going to make it in this business. And you should go back to being a lawyer. And by the way, I hope you're better at that than you are at being a reporter. So super wow. humiliating Ouch. and crushing. Um, but it taught me a lot of things. Like it was really painful. And I cried and I was so embarrassed. And I thought, you know, these people who've told me you're an idiot to leave your law firm and go do this, like, were they right? I thought mm -hmm. I was really pursuing yeah. where I thought God was leading me. So um, it took many, many, many months to even get another interview somewhere else because I really didn't have a lot to work with as far as, you know, my tape of my work and what if it really was terrible. But it, it made me think, do you really want to do this? Are you open to criticism? you're maybe terrible. And like, how do you get better? And what can you do? Um, and so I just decided to double down and fight back. And I knew that the Lord was teaching me in the waiting, which is so hard. Um, but just that you have to stay humble. You cannot love your job more than him or anyone else. Um, and I find a lot of identity in my job. So I have to fight that. I mean, to this day, but it taught me a lot uh, about holding loosely to that kind of thing. And many Many twists and turns later, um, I met Britt Hume where he was backstage waiting to give a speech. And that was my connection into Fox. And 14 years later, here I am. I love that in your story in the, the book, that um, Finding the Bright Side. Um, I love that you're honest about those twists and turns and the humiliating things. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, because it's it's true that... We, we do grow so much in those, in those times that are like, ouch, that, that really hurt. Like I'm the worst person. So either okay. I got to get better or change my profession. <laughs> and right. so those kind or of start buying lottery tickets. Yeah. And, and just, <laughs> I think it's, you know, it, it's so tempting for us as humans, no matter what our platform is or isn't, or what our job is or isn't, it is so hard to understand that our identity is in Christ because of Christ, not because of what we've done or what, how good we are at a certain thing. And so a lot of times it's those humiliating things that make us really realize, oh, okay, that's, yeah. Okay, so I think that leads well actually to your new book, Shannon, that we want to talk to you about. And uh, for one thing, just, yeah, your humbleness in your story, um, and you point out in the book how... All these women in the Bible, the, their stories are very humbling because they're real women. They have lots of, they make lots of mistakes. They stumble along the way. Um, and so I guess first let's start with why, why did you decide to write this book? What was your motivation behind that? You know, honestly, Fox came to me because they were starting a book label of their own. And they said to me last summer, hey, we're thinking about doing something in this space with women, with religion and faith. We know that you're open about that. Would you be interested? And I was like, amazing. Yes, I would love to do this. Um, and we worked with the publisher on the concept of, you know, which women we would include and how we would do this. And I did fight for people like Rahab, like Tamar, people who are flawed because I love that every single one of us is flawed. And I love that um, the Bible does not sanitize these characters. They did some really, really crazy, not good things. Um, but we saw that God worked through them. And some of the people that you would consider the most um, outrageous women who really got off track in the Bible, they're in the lineage of Christ himself. So I love that God doesn't try to hide them away somewhere. I mean, we get to see all the good and the bad and how he worked through their stories. Yeah. Yeah. So how, okay, so the one thing I, I really liked about the book um, and wanted to ask you about was, so each chapter you kind of highlight two women and you weave their stories together. Now, sometimes it makes sense, like um, Sarah and Hagar, you know, but also there were other times where I was like, oh, when I got to the beginning of the chapter, I'm like, oh, I wonder how she's going to weave these two together. But just the idea of like each chapter having two women, what was what was even your thoughts behind that? 
Well, yeah, some of them did know each other. So it was good to see their stories play off each other. But others had a common thread. Um, like with Queen Esther, a lot of people are familiar with her story, even if they're not, um, you know, people who are people of faith or in church, they may have some familiarity with her story. But I really wanted to pair her with Rahab because both of them came to a point where they risked their own lives essentially to save the nation of Israel. Um, and Queen Esther did this on a huge platform as somebody who was an orphan and God clearly divinely led her to this place where she was the queen and where she had great favor with the king and great respect from him that he honored her request when she came to him to try to save her people. Uh, and Rahab was an innkeeper and we believe a prostitute. Um, and, but she was also in this place where the spies from Israel came in to try to scout out Jericho that she lied to protect them. She was not an Israelite, but she lied to protect them um, as somebody who became part of the family um, and, and gave them a great victory there when they needed it um, against the people of Jericho. So I thought that, you know, so many of these women, there were common threads. If they knew each other, that was one thing. But otherwise, I found there were common principles that we could could find and study by looking at them together. Yeah. And, and as you reflect back on the all the different stories, was there one that stood out more than the others that you learned the most from? I've always loved the story of the woman with the issue of bleeding. And I start the book with her and we come back to her in the book too, because you think about her for 12 years, we're told when we meet her, she's out of funds. Like she spent every dime that she has trying to find a cure. She's not been cured. And, you know, I learned a lot um, in turning to a couple of good theological experts who let me pick their brains, you know, for this book to, to, and, and realizing she was probably considered unclean in that time where she wouldn't have been able to be in the temple or be in the marketplaces or be around crowds. She probably was super isolated, like a lot of people felt in the depths of the pandemic, like just no social connections, no ability to go out beyond that. Um, but she heard about Jesus. And for some reason, she had faith that if she could just touch his garment, that would be enough to heal her. And then we see that's what she eventually does. So he knows, immediately we're told that she's healed. He knows the power has gone out from him. And he turns around and says, who touched me? Um, and one of the disciples in one of the accounts in the gospels, you can almost hear him sort of laughing like, you're in this huge crowd all the time. People are always trying to touch you. Um, but clearly when Christ asks that question, he knows. And we're told in the gospel, she falls down trembling before him because he could have humiliated her and said, how dare you reach out to me? How dare you be in this crowd even? How, how are you even outside your home? But in none of those accounts does he do any of that. He says to her, daughter, your faith has made you whole. I mean, he, he immediately telegraphs full acceptance directly from him to her, but also to anybody who was watching there who may have known her story or known who she was. And I just love that. I think it's so beautiful. Um, I struggled with a season in my life with a chronic illness and with excruciating pain. And I just remember feeling that I had nowhere else to go and the darkest part of that. So I've always felt very connected to her. And I just love the compassion that Christ shows her. I wonder if she actually felt like what I would love to ask her someday, you know, yeah. did she feel that healing in the moment? You know, it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We'll ask her when we get to heaven. <laughs> yeah, we will ask I her. I got a lot of questions. Totally. And I love that you start, I mean, you had me hooked from the intro because of that story. And I've studied the gospel many times, but just the, which, which you pointed out, like all three of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record her story. Of course, they record different stories, but they all three recorded her story. And just to think of the cultural context, like you said, of bleeding for 12 years. Now, as women, we all know that would be absolutely miserable. Well, now go back 2,000 years in Jewish culture and, and bringing that to light. So I love that story. And just throughout the book, um, because, of course, through all these women's stories, like you just highlighted, it it shows us who Jesus is and how he was just unlike any man that walked the earth and his great compassion and love. And so all throughout you through these women's stories, you're just drawn back to Christ. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I love the book. And and actually, one thing I wanted to ask you about, too, is you dedicated this book to your two grandmothers. So tell us about that. Where did, why did you dedicate it to the, to your two sweet grandmas? You know, I love them and they've, uh, they've both been such lights in my life. My grandmother, Nell, who was the one I spent so much time with growing up um, with, I just loved her. She just 
was warm and safe and nurturing. And um, the older she got, uh, one of our traditions was every Sunday we went to church. And she took it very seriously. She would dress up. She would wear a hat. We always had lunch afterwards and spent the afternoon with her. And I just love it. She was such a cheerful person. She loved to sing the hymns at the top of her lungs. And, you know, on Easter, growing up down in Florida, we used to go to Easter sunrise service on the beach. And it's such a beautiful experience to do that way. And she always, her favorite thing was the, they would always sing the hymn, Up From the Grave. <laughs> yes. And she was singing at the top of her lungs. Um, and I just loved, my grandma Nell just lived out her faith every day. She lived to be 102. Um, and I can't wait to see her again in heaven. My grandmother, Margaret, is still with us. She'll be 96 in August. And, um, you know, I finally got to see her not long ago, her fully vaccinated and just to hug her and be with her, which was a great thing. But she's somebody who, even though she, you know, she's in a time in her life where she's struggling with her vision and with her health. And she's very real about that. But she also maintains this sort of, you know, I woke up today. The Lord gave me another day. I talk to him all the time. I tell him I'm ready to come home when he's ready for me. But as long as I'm here, I'm just going to be thankful for this day. And I just love that attitude. I think we all need that. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and again, we have a similarity, Shannon, because I am I love my grandmas dearly, and actually, they're both now in heaven. But one lived to 103, and and the other one lived to 98, and it was it. I know I was going to say we both have good genes, and their faith. My grandmas too were just really devoted to Christ, and I. I cherish having them in my lives for so long as the models, like you're saying, of just faithfulness, of joy through hard circumstances, of even towards the end of life being open to, I'm ready to go home, but I'll wait for him to call me. And so that's, so I love that you dedicated it to your grandmas. Um, that is just a sweet thing. Okay, we'd love to ask our guests if they have any advice for young women today, and like in this cultural moment. Yeah, a couple of things I would say. My mom really instilled in me growing up a lot of self-worth, not in an arrogant way. She was very careful. She didn't want to cultivate that. But in that you are so valuable, you are a precious daughter of the king, and you don't have to do what everybody else thinks is cool. I was a weirdo nerd, and it's fine. Um, (laughs) You don't have to, you know, the proverbial, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you? I mean, my parents just taught me, like, that's not where you find your worth is, and, and you know, somebody posted a quote the other day that I'd read years ago from C.S. Lewis that was so good who talked about if you're always pursuing that inner ring, once you break through and get there, you'll realize there's another one and you're going to have to fight to get into that one and get inside that one. You're going to find there's another fight to get in the next one. I mean, there's only so much approval and peer acceptance um, that you're going to be willing to put up with if your identity is in Christ. And don't think, I, and to me these days too, I think about that for young women with social media, don't judge your worth on the likes that you get or the comments that you get. Please don't. It is, you are worth so much more than that. You are so valuable and precious and don't feel like you have to give away parts of yourself or sell your soul for people who um, you may never know, uh, or even if it's people you do know, like that is not where you find your worth and you are so precious. I just want you to know that. Um, Also, just don't take no for an answer. If there's really something you believe God has placed in your heart, um, a passion, whether it's career or motherhood or relationship or a ministry he's called you to, whatever, you're going to have challenges and people who will tell you it can't be done. I've had that Millions of times, I feel like in my life, everybody's going to hit those walls. But if you believe God has called you to it, just find a way around, find another person, find another avenue. God will open another door. Um, just don't give up on your dreams when you know they're from the Lord. Mm-hmm. Okay, so previously in the conversation, you said something about persistence was like a gift yeah. <laughs> that you have. You just are like, okay, well, I'll just ask again in a minute. <laughs> right. I feel like you would just outlast people, yeah. honestly, or wear them down. <laughs> yes, in a wear them down. Way. That's what you said. Um, so I really, I really think that's how you get a lot of things accomplished in mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. You know? Yes. Yeah. That's great advice. Okay. So we also love to talk about books on this podcast. So we're just curious, Shannon, what books are you reading right now? Or maybe are you a one book at a time person or do you have many books going? You know, when I'm in my regular work schedule, it's hard for me to read. So I continue building a stack. Like I always, <laughs> there's stacks of books everywhere. And then like a couple of weeks ago, we took a week off and I read three books because it's the chance for me to catch up on stuff I really want to read. I read for hours a day for work and a lot of it's very technical or medical journals or political, you know, pieces of legislation, whatever. 
Um, so I like to have fun. Um, there are a couple of fiction authors. I love Fanny Flagg. She is one of my faves of all time. And she, her newest book um, I had and took with me on this trip, The Wonder Boy of Whistle Stop. Um, if you've read any of her books, they, she wrote Fry Green Tomatoes, which was a huge movie and is a well-known book. Um, she writes Southern fiction, which is, these are my people. So I love her stuff. Um, I also read by Rod Dreyer, Live Not By Lies, which was super thought provoking. Wow. I mean, there was a lot I'm still digesting from that. And because of his book, it's, it's sparked me to read some other things. Um, and so I'm working on a couple of those, but I also, for another fiction author, love Joel Rosenberg. He's written a number of fantastic fiction books, but he also is an excellent nonfiction writer, but his latest fiction book is the Beirut protocol. And I'm just starting that one too. And he writes all about current events, um, things involving the middle East or Russia or political things. Um, but in a fictional way, and he's so gifted. Um, he is a Christian who has now got dual citizenship in Israel and he's actually there in the midst of everything that's going on. And he just has a real burden um, for the Jewish people. His background, his family is Jewish, um, but he has become a Messianic believer um, and is just a super talented author. So I really enjoy his stuff too. Mm -hmm. You know, we have had so many guests and listeners say that they had listened to, or sorry, read Live Not By Lies by Rod Dreher. And Aaron and I have both read it and so good that we had Rod on the podcast oh, and um, he's so wonderful. And then what we really zoned in on um, the Camilla Ben, the Benda story. I don't know if you remember that in the book, they were a family in Prague and we asked him yes. all about to tell us more about what he had learned about Camilla, the mother, mm -hmm. and it was so powerful. So um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to remind a powerful our, book. It really so is. powerful. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I love that he ends with things that we can do, you know, yeah. ways that we can build and, and promote Community good, and true and rights. beautiful mm -hmm. things. And um, anyway, okay. Last question. Um, if you could have coffee with any woman from history, who would it be? You know what? I knew her story, but totally fell in love with it in writing this book. And I want to say Deborah, Judge Deborah from the Old Testament. Okay. She is amazing to me in that she, especially it, it kind of breaks up the myth that people say women can't have leadership or they mm -hmm. can't, whatever. She was leading the nation of Israel and right. her story is in the Bible. She was there not only as somebody to answer theological disputes and legal disputes, but you know, they were in a bad position when Deborah came along. The, the Israelites were in one of their many times like we do, where you get away from God, you're out of, um, you know, his graces. And they were being very harshly persecuted by the Canaanites. And they've come back to God like, please help us. We promise we'll get it right this time. Like we all do. <laughs> right. Um, and Deborah said she went and got their top general, Barak was his name, and said, God has told me we're going into battle. Get the men together and we're going against the Canaanites, which on paper was ridiculous because they were so undermanned and they didn't have the same weaponry or the chariots or anything the Canaanites had. And Barack has this hesitation where he says, I'll do it if you go with me, but if you don't go, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. And so they knew clearly that she was anointed and she's like, okay, we're going to do this. But because of your hesitation, the opposing general, Sisera, the bad guy on the other side, he's actually going to be delivered into the hands of a woman. And you watch this play out, this incredible battle, which I love one of the things that God did was it rained so hard all those big fancy chariots they had, the wheels got stuck and they were no good. I mean, <laughs> God can work in ways that we would never imagine. And it was a complete routing. It's not like Israel like basically squeaked out a win here. Like they took care of everyone was taken out except for Sisera. And when he went running for his life, that's where we meet the woman, the second woman in the story, Yael, who actually fulfills that prophecy. She's the one who takes him out. So I just love so much about Deborah's story. She then goes on to afterwards leave this like victory parade. So she apparently is a praise and worship leader too, <laughs> singing this song, um, constantly reflecting all the praise and glory for this victory back to God. And I just think she would have been really cool to know. I mean, smart, brave, mm -hmm. obedient, things that I would aspire to. So Deborah, when I get yeah. to heaven, please save a few minutes for me. <laughs> yes. Amen. Well, Shannon, thank you so, so much for coming on our podcast, for sharing your story with us, um, for your book. And we hope our uh, listeners will get your book and just be encouraged by the stories in it. And two, I just want to say as, as someone who does, I, I catch your show on an app because I can't stay up as late to watch <laughs> Not with it. all those kiddos, especially, unless somebody's <laughs> sick and they're up and they're, you know, then you're yes. up in the middle of the night. 
totally. But I, I, I like apps because then you can watch things later on. But one thing I just wanted to say since I have this opportunity with you that I appreciate so much how you take your job as a journalist seriously to to bring the truth to people. And I also love that you are one of the few people I feel like on TV still who will present both sides. I love how you make your guests be kind to each other. Mm -hmm. um, I've watched episodes where you're like, okay, buddy, you know, and you've had to say things. I just think your um, pursuit of truth and your graciousness comes through to an average viewer like me. And, and knowing you're a Christian, I think that just is a really powerful testimony. So thank you for what you're doing in, in journalism and for, um, you know, your commitment to Christ. And so we just appreciate you so much. And thanks again for giving us your time today. Thank you so much for your kind words. I really do want people to feel when they watch the show that they come away having maybe learned something, that our our debates are respectful, um, and just that, um, you know, I, I'm about a bigger bigger mission, I guess, about my father's business while also feeling really blessed to do what he's got me doing right now. So Aaron and Sarah, it is so nice to meet you guys virtually and thank you for having me. <laughs>